This video is going to be about um, electroplating cells and particularly bringing in some calculations with regards to this, which looks at Faraday's laws. Um, here you can see um, a cell set up and it has um, a tin anode and then it's got an object to be plated at the cathode. Um, the question's asking what are the reactions that are going to occur at the anode and cathode. So remember to do these, you need to write down all the species that are available, which is solid tin, tin 2 plus ions and water. Um, at the anode, you want the strongest reductant, which happens to be tin. So tin is going to be oxidised into tin 2 plus ions. At the cathode, you need the strongest oxidant, which also happens to be tin 2 plus, it's stronger than water. So you get the reduction of tin 2 plus ions into solid tin. Um, the object to be plated, by the way, must be able to conduct electricity as it is the cathode. It's connected via wire to the negative part of the power supply. It's not connected to a cathode. It is the cathode. So whatever you want to be um, plated in electroplating must be able to um, conduct electricity. It's also worth noting that the anode must be made out of the metal to be electroplated. So if you've got a, if you want to plate something with tin, you need a tin anode. Um, why? Because you don't want the concentration of tin 2 plus ions to change. You get a better plating quality um, if it doesn't. So um, if you have a tin anode, the rate of the um, production of tin 2 plus ions at the anode will equal the rate of tin 2 plus ions being consumed at the cathode. Um, so how much tin will be deposited? Well, this depends on a number of things. The charge on the ion, in this case I mean like 2 plus, the current passed through the cell, and for how long. Um, by the way, the voltage of this cell is kept a bit above zero. Remember we've discussed the um, voltage is generally the E naught of the oxidant minus the E naught of the reductant plus a little bit more to overcome resistance in the cell. Well, the difference between them would be zero, so it's just a little bit above zero. Um, here is two, uh, is a graph, I should say, and a table from your book. What I'd like you to do is to try to answer the question, what conclusion could be drawn from this data? I.e. if you change one variable, what happens to the other one? We can see from the graph, the x-axis is charge, with this letter C. We're going to learn soon that C stands for coulombs. And the y-axis says mass of silver deposited at the cathode in grams. As you can see, as the charge increases, the mass of silver deposit at the cathode also increases. Now, if you look at the table, they've brought in another variable, which is time in seconds. And as you can see, as the time increases, the charge increases, which means the mass of silver deposited at the cathode also increases. And this happens to be the first of Faraday's two laws about um, <clears throat> electrochemistry or electrolysis. Um, Faraday or Michael Faraday was um, a very famous scientist working in the 19th century, did um, a lot of work towards um, electrochemistry, um, also quite a bit of physics, but um, <clears throat> he was the one who set up a whole lot of electrolytic cells um, pretty much came up with the terms anode, cathode, electrode, electrolyte, did a lot of work on this. Um, so he came up with two laws. The first of them, based on data similar to what we just looked at, means the mass of de deposited on the cathode is directly proportional to the electrical charge passed through the cell. <clears throat> now, um, I mentioned before the electrical charge, which is given the symbol capital Q, is measured in a unit called coulombs, which is given um, the symbol capital C. Now, um, directly proportional means as one goes up, 
the other one also goes up, so mass is directly proportional to charge. Quit now if you can't learn this equation, IEQ equals IT. By the way, it is in your data booklet, but it's just easy to remember quit if you um, can't learn this one. By the way, Q, as we've just said, that's the electrical charge that's passed through the cell, um, <clears throat> which is um, measured in coulombs. It equals the current in amps times the time in seconds. It's important to remember that seconds, so if the time is given to you in minutes, you'll have to convert. Um, by the way, for the, all you non-physicists, the current, um, the symbol is I, um, so that's the current in amps. What's current? It's flow of electrons. One amp is the flow of one coulomb of electron electrical charge per second, hence the time is always in seconds. Now here's another um, bit of data for you, where it said what conclusion conclusions can you draw from this? I want you to have a look carefully at this graph and see what you can make of it. The, um, if you look at the y-axis this time, it isn't mass, it's moles. It says amount of metal deposited the cathode in moles. And you've either got one, two, three, four. Um, then on the x-axis, you've got a whole lot of 96,500s and that's the charge in coulombs. So what you can conclude is to deposit one mole of silver, you need one lot of 96,500 coulombs. To deposit one mole of either copper, tin or lead, you need two lots of 96,500 coulombs. And to deposit one mole of chromium, you need three lots of 96,500 coulombs. Now, why the um, one, two and three? Well, the charge on a silver iron is one plus. Copper, tin and lead have two plus and chromium has three plus. Hmm, there must be some relation between 96,500 coulombs and the charge on their ions. Well, this is what Faraday came up with for his second law. Um, I want you to write down these laws, by the way. So it says, for one mole of a substance to be deposited, evolved or dissolved at an electrode, the passage of one, two, three, or a whole number of moles of electrons is required, depending on the charge of the iron. By the way, deposited means a solid metal, deposited the cathode, evolved means a gas, either the anode or cathode, or dissolved means oxidation of metal at the anode. So if you look at those equations, for silver, because it's got one plus as a charge on the iron, it needs one mole of electrons to get one mole of solid metal. A copper two plus iron would require two moles of electrons to get one mole of solid copper. And a chromium 3 plus ion needs, or one mole of them, needs three moles of electrons to get one mole of um, solid chromium. So what is the connection between 96,500 coulombs and moles of electrons? Because remember the table, we, or the graph we saw before, said to get one mole of solid silver, you needed one lot of 96,500 coulombs. For one mole of copper, you needed two lots of 96,500 coulombs. Can you guess the relationship? Yes, you guessed it. The charge on one mole of electrons is 96,500 coulombs. The charge on one mole of electrons happens to be called one Faraday. If you're pretty famous, you might as well get um, a unit named after yourself. It's called capital F. So one Faraday is 96,500 coulombs, which is the charge on one mole of electrons. By the way, 96,500, you don't have to remember. It is in your data booklet. So before we had Q equals IT, or the current times time, now we've got a different way of expressing Q, 
which is the number of moles of electrons times Faraday, or you could rearrange that to be number of moles of electrons is Q divided by F. Q, don't forget, is always in coulombs, and Faraday um, is always 96,500. And by the way, the one I've just put a box around is in your data booklet. As stated, Faraday is always 96,500. Um, I've just got down the bottom here, it says also is Q equals IT and energy equals VIT. Rearrange, they will substitute um, IT for Q and you get E equals VQ. Now, where have you seen energy equals VIT before? You've seen it in calorimetry that we did earlier. And it happens to be in joules if you do this. Now, it's worth um, putting in your notes this E equals VQ um, because it isn't covered in your textbook. But um, see over for a question that requires this one. Okay, so I'm going to give you a moment um, to write this question down and um, see what you can make of it. It says an ethanol fuel cell with an acidic electrolyte has a cathode half equation of, as stated, it's a reduction of oxygen. If the ethanol is oxidised to carbon dioxide, give the anode half equation, you should be able to do that. Then here's the interesting bit. The voltage across the fuel cell is 1.15 volts. Calculate the electrical energy in megajoules provided per mole of ethanol consumed in the fuel cell. Right, so we'll do A first. So your ethanol is going to become carbon dioxide. You have to balance the number of carbon dioxides. Now you balance oxygens by adding waters. So we need three of them on the left. You now balance hydrogens with hydrogen ions, so you need 12 on the right. You balance charge with electrons, so you need 12 electrons on the right-hand side. That you should have been able to do. Now the next bit. It says calculate the electrical energy, not combustion. So you don't just go to the data booklet and look at the energy content of ethanol, because that's if you combusted it. This one's different. So we're going to need something else. So this is where E equals VQ can come in handy. Because it's got volts in there, you've got volts in the question, and we've got electrons. And we're going to somehow link electrons to Q. So the volts is 1.15. Q is number of moles of electrons times Faraday's. So the number of moles of electrons is 12. That was from my half equation up above. Faraday's is always 96,500. So therefore the energy equals volts, 1.15 times 12 times 96,500, which is 1.33 times 10 to the 6 joules. Don't forget this comes out in joules because VIT is in joules. Um, divide this <coughs> by 10 to the 6 and you get 1.33 megajoules. So like I said, it is worth noting that E equals VQ comes in handy. Um, a next question um, that's in your notes. Um, it says, a silver plating cell operates with a steady current of 30 amps for 20 minutes. What mass of silver is deposited on the um, cathode? I would like you to pause the video and have a go at this question and then come back and see how you went. Right. Q equals IT. Always start out with this one. Amps times time. So I've got 30 times 20 times 60 because I have to put it into seconds, which is 36,000 coulombs. The number of moles of electrons is Q on F. Why do I need number of moles of electrons? Because I have to get to the mass of silver. So I'm going to have to somehow find out the moles of silver. I'm going to get to the moles of silver via the moles of electrons. 
So that's 0.373 moles of electrons. Then it's always worth writing out your reduction half equation so you can relate the moles of the metal to the moles of electrons. In this case, it's in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the moles of silver is the same as the moles of electrons. The mass of silver is a moles times molar mass, which is 40.3 grams to um, three significant figures. Hopefully you did okay on that one. Um, I now would like you to try these two questions from your textbook. So pause the video, go and do these two questions and then come back to um, see how you went. So for the first one, the, uh, the question's effectively asking you a cell runs at 20 amps for 15 minutes. What mass of copper is um, deposited at the cathode? So always start Q equals IT. Remember the time has to be in seconds, so it's 18,000 coulombs. Um, to get the number, to get the mass of copper, you have to go via moles of copper. So you have to go via moles of electrons. So number of moles of electrons is Q on F, which is 0.187. Write out the reduction half equation to look at the ratio between electrons and moles of metal. So this time, because you need two electrons per mole of copper, the moles of copper is half the number of moles of electrons, which is 0.0933. The mass is times the molar mass, so it's 5.92 grams. How did you go on that one? Right, the second one is asking you for how long a cell needs to run for this time. So what time in hours is required to deposit 20 grams of silver at the cathode if a cell operates at a current of 6.5 amps? So write out Q equals IT. Now we just have to rearrange it to solve for time, which is Q on I. Q equals number of moles of electrons times F. Again, we need a half equation so we can look at the relationship between moles of metal and moles of electrons. They're the same as each other, but I'm going to have to figure out moles of electrons via the moles of silver. I'm going to get the moles of silver from the mass of silver. Um, so it's 20 over 107.9 is 0.185 moles of silver. So therefore I go back to the original equation or I need time equals number of moles of electrons, 0.185, times F, 96,500, divided by the current, which is 6.5, and I get 2,752 seconds, don't forget this is going to be, but the question is asking how many hours will it take? So do I divide that by 3,600 to get 0.764 hours? How'd you go on that one? Right. Here's a last question for you in this video. I want you to pause the video and write this one down. Right, this question is um, quite similar to ones we've done before, but this time it has an efficiency value in there, which means effectively not all of the electrons that are passed through the cell um, go to the cathode to form solid metal. So it said, what mass of zinc is plated when a current of 70 amps is passed through for 30 minutes? So start with Q equals IT. Don't forget it has to be in seconds, so you get 126,000 coulombs. The next thing is always number of moles of electrons is Q on F, so we get 1.31 moles of electrons. Write your reduction half equation, so I know that I have two electrons for every zinc. So therefore the number of moles of zinc is going to be half the number of moles of electrons, which is 0.653. So the mass, I just multiply that by the molar mass and I get 42.7 grams. However, the question doesn't end there because we have to deal with this 85% efficiency, which means we're going to multiply this value by 0.85, or 85 over 100, which is 
36.3 grams of zinc will be plated after that time. Okay. Thank you.